folks, and thanks for dropping in to another episode of Off the Record. For today's episode, I decided to reach out to someone who I'd already interviewed pre-pandemic, simply because now I had more time to talk to them, and last time our interview got cut short. I'm talking about Justin Benlolo, the frontman and founder of Broken Love, a rock group based out of Toronto and, I guess, New York, uh, simply because everyone else in the band is from New York, aside from Justin. Anyway, Justin and I talk about the band and his origin story for working in the music industry, which is fascinating. Uh, we also chat about how scary today's heart video games are. I hope you enjoy. First off, thanks so much for uh, taking the time to chat with me today, dude. I really appreciate it. I don't, I don't really have a lot going on right now, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a very interesting couple of months for all of us, but uh, tell me how, how did COVID affect the band? Like, were you guys currently like on the road or anything like that? Or um, I remember when, actually, when, when you guys came to Lee's Palace, that was like the fourth last show of the tour. So it, 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 the timing sort of worked out perfectly because we got home on the 4th of March and then my, my band flew okay. back to New York and I think the day that they got back to New York on like the 6th or the 7th, it, they immediately went into lockdown and, uh, and Toronto like followed suit like pretty, or I guess all of Canada followed suit pretty, pretty uh, soon afterwards. Um, but yeah, I mean... I was supposed to be on tour right now, <laughs> you know, like we were supposed to be touring oh, essentially yeah. all of May, um, most of June, I think July, we were supposed to have a, a little bit of a break, but we were going to go back out in August. Um, we had some plans for September as well. So basically like we lost like three or four months basically of touring. So the summer was just, it's just a wash now and now, you know, I mean, I'm writing music. I'm doing what yeah. I can on that front, but, um, but yeah, you know, much like other bands, like obviously it's it's out of our hands. We can't control it, so it doesn't feel like a direct like hit, you know, because everybody's in this together. But but yeah, you know, mm -hmm. we lost our touring pretty much, just like a lot of other people. What kind of stuff have you been doing to keep busy? Weather's nice. At least I can go outside, you know. And uh, yeah. I've been biking a lot. Like, <clears throat> excuse me, I got bad allergies, which is another thing I should mention. Now the weather's nice, of course, like when I go outside, the pollen just attacks me and then I, I, I can't be outside for that long. Um, but I've been writing music, you know, as much as I can. I mean, it's sort of becoming a, a daunting process now because there's almost this like, uh, like, I feel like I'm, we're forcing creativity because we have all this downtime and like a lot of our art right now like oh well we're not doing anything let's just write a bunch of music and um there's something sort of like intrinsic intrinsically like wrong with that i think because you should never be forced like to do anything <laughs> and i think that especially when you're making music and trying to create art and all that kind of stuff like the last thing you want is to is to push yourself to do something when you don't really feel like doing it you know and there hit there has been this sort of like back and forth in my mind where like oh well you know i'm not really doing much maybe i should just write more but then on the other side i'm like oh well i don't really feel like writing but i feel like i'm obligated to because i have all this downtime and i won't have this time in the future to do it um i mean that being said i have been writing songs and, I, and i've already written a handful um that i think are good you know which is good um that are, i guess are just <laughs> gonna stick around until you know we can actually do anything with it um we're probably not going to end up touring. Like I'm, I'm, I'm assuming touring business probably won't come back to like spring or next summer. You yeah. know, they're even saying, yeah, they're even saying next year. Yeah. And that's just being optimistic. Like a lot of people are still sending us messages because, um, one of the tours we were supposed to be on didn't officially cancel. Like they rescheduled. Um, so some of the dates are still marked down and people ask me like, Hey, are you playing on like the 28th of July? And, North Carolina, I'm like, no, you know, which kind of sucks for them because like, obviously we're not in control of that. You know, we don't get to make the call of what's being rescheduled, what's canceled, whatever, because we're like the opening band. So, you know, it is sort of like an interesting thing that's happening right now where people are like, they're, they're rescheduling the tour so they don't have to give back people's money, you know, which, uh, 
I don't necessarily yeah. agree with, you know, I don't think that's the right thing to do. Um, but a lot of people are just are doing that anyways. I mean, I get it because it's a loss of revenue. Not that that's really important to this conversation, you know, but it's like you shouldn't be taking people's money and, and holding on to it, you know, yeah. for the sake of like for, for like a year. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whenever they sure. think it's going to go back on. But again, like that's out of our hands. We don't really control any of that stuff, you know. So we apologize. <laughs> uh, and you guys were... Was this the tour that was happening with Alter Bridge? The one-off with Alter Bridge at some point that was supposed to happen like a couple days ago or something. Like, I don't really know the exact date. Right, yeah. But um, we were going to be on tour with Pop Evil. And um, okay. and like, which would have been our second tour with them, which would have been really cool because we toured with them back in September and they're great. And we already have that relationship. So the tour was already going to be that much more fun. And um Throughout May, you know, all the all the rock festivals were supposed to happen, like Aftershock and uh, Epicenter, Sonic Temple. Like we were supposed to do all those. Um, a couple other things that I, I can't remember right now, but May was like packed for us, and June was pretty slammed as well. And then we were supposed to do something in August with um with um what's the band called? Oh man, I'm blanking right now. Um, they're like from, from Texas. Crowbot. We were supposed to do something with Crowbot in August, oh. which would have been sick too. Right on. You know, because they sort of like fit in our world and people have compared us to them, um, which is awesome. So that would have been a lot of fun. I don't know what was like in the cards for September. I know that we were cooking some, some things up that I probably can't mention because it's not going to happen anyways. But um, oh. I mean, it, it doesn't really matter now in hindsight, like, you know. But uh, we did have some plans for some stuff in September. And, you know, and obviously, like, the, the biggest thing for me that sucks is that it, it, it was sort of unfortunate because, you know, my biggest fear was, like, this album wasn't going to get a proper shot when it came out anyways. And, of course, like, it, it's nobody's fault. But, you know, we put up the album right when everything sort of started getting crazy in the world. And, um, of course, it's out of everybody's hands because we didn't, nobody has control over that. So that's sort of, you know, for me, that's the most disappointing part about this whole thing. I could deal with not touring for a little bit. Of course, like it's going to suck not to tour for another year. But a part of me is like, man, we, we made this really, really great record, in my opinion. Um, and I'm so proud of it. And we can't go out and promote it, really, you know, because now obviously you know there's a pandemic and it's not safe but um nobody's really doing much right now just 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 on 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 like marketing fronts and and, and label fronts and stuff just because it's sort of a an interesting situation where why would you spend money on something if there's like a, a very um it, it, it just, there's, there's a very unlikely chance that people are going to pick up on new bands and all that kind of stuff right now. Mm -hmm. Unless you're established, you know, if you're like Drake or something, you drop a single, you don't need anybody. Yeah. You just put it on Twitter and it's fine. But, you know, like we're a new band and we don't have that, that, um, that outreach and, and the, um, and, and the fan base to sort of do that. Um, we sort of rely on, on, on a lot of people to help us out. And like I said, listen, it's nobody's fault and I understand what happened, but, that's sort of been tough for me to swallow just because I didn't want this album to go to waste. And I don't think it will entirely. Like there is a lot of people that have, you know, gotten it or have been listening to it, which I'm grateful for. Mm -hmm. um, it just sort of sucks that we're not able to go out on the road and sort of back it. Cause my, my, my opinion on it has always been like, well, you know, out of sight, out of mind, because we're a new band. It's sort of hard for people to, to, you know, follow us around unless they're true fans, which we, we do have a, a bunch of those, which I'm, again, I'm super, super grateful for. But a, a lot of what we're doing now to expand the fan base and get people to listen to us is going out and playing shows, you yeah. know, and being put in front of people, um, which obviously we can't do. And that, that's sort of a great catalyst uh, to introduce, introducing people to our music where they otherwise, you know, wouldn't really find it on their own unless they, you know, go through a Spotify playlist and all that kind of stuff, which... We've been grateful again to have a bunch of um, a, bu a bunch of playlist thing, and that's been super awesome. You know, mm -hmm. I guess the upside is that streaming has been really good since the pandemic started because people are listening to a lot of music now. Yeah, um, 
But I think for a rock band, it's like so crucial for rock bands to go out and tour and be put in front of people just because that's where rock really belongs in my mind and where rock thrives. Definitely, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's as like soon as you see a line, right? they get more connected to it. You know, it's like they've seen you, you yeah. know. <laughs> they felt your sweat, you know. They've seen you grind. Yeah. Um, <laughs> For real, it's like, you know, everybody's in this sort of moment together and it becomes a sort of magical thing that we can't really recreate now, even though people are doing like live streams and, you know, like Instagram Live and whatever and all that kind of stuff, which is great because it's, it is a way to, you know, play live music again. It just doesn't capture the same feel, obviously, you know, and I just argue that even more so for a rock band where like, a live show is so integral to the rock experience mm -hmm. that um, that's sort of been a bit of a bummer for me and the rest of the dudes. Right. Yeah. Um, but that being said, like, listen, we're working on new music. I don't think people are going to forget about the album. Um, uh, I know we have some plans that I can't really talk about yet. Um, right. That we're gonna we're gonna do some stuff soon, you know. But but yeah, I mean, I guess that's really my two cents. I don't mean to. Ramble. <laughs> no, no, no worries, no worries, man. That, that's why this, this platform is great. Like we can ramble away for uh, as long as you you have time. We can keep talking. <laughs> well, I love to talk, and you know I'm really passionate about this stuff. So I haven't really gotten a chance to do much uh, of any of this since this has started. You know, I mean, like I said, everything's sort of sleeping right now. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, we're, we're taking it. We're taking the liberty of like. You know, being super active on um, social media and all that kind of stuff. You yeah, know? I've been noticing that. Yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, that's really the only way we could we can connect with people now. Of course, you know. Um, so that's even though it's something I, I like truthfully despise. <laughs> like I really hate it. I really dislike the social media thing, and I'm not really a big social media guy myself. Right. Um, but of course, now you know we recognize it as an important tool. You know, and it's it's so important nowadays to be active and and build a sort of aesthetic and, and a connection to people. Um, and I'll ne I'll never get tired of, of of talking to to fans or anybody that wants to reach out and and, and just send me a message because I pretty much respond to everybody. You know, yeah. I mean, I'm just I'm just like surprised that people actually like this band <laughs> and know who we are. You know, so that's just amazing enough to me. And if people want to reach out to me, like that's all day you know I, I literally hit everybody back just because i'm so thankful for the uh for the appreciation yeah um but it is just it's just so exhausting sometimes like you know trying to come up with content and it, it, it's all just very uh, uh to me sometimes it's silly <laughs> you know just because i wish we could just put out the music and play the shows and i don't have to post you know pictures and build some sort of like i guess quote unquote brand online mm -hmm. um but it's just so important now you know yeah like i said i feel like if we stop it's like then people forget who we are um which hopefully will change as the years go by and, and, and you know hopefully the band uh gains more and more success right right um yeah you you uh you did mention that so the rest of the band you're the only are you the only canadian in the band the only Canadian in the yeah. band. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, uh, and you said the, the rest of the guys, are, are they all based in New York? They're all in New York City. Oh, man. That's, so they, like, had to go right back to, like, literally one of the world's biggest, like, <laughs> you know, hot zones for uh, for all of this. That's, uh, is everyone in the band okay? Like, uh, all the guys are doing all right? You know, everybody's responsible in my band. We're not, like, <laughs> we're not, like, denying that the pandemic is real and, like, denying that masks are important and we're keeping clean you know it's yeah. like we're pretty level-headed guys and of course like being in new york city it's particularly scary um even though it's getting a little bit better now it's just like when they were there right at the beginning it was insane mm -hmm. you know and they told me they were hearing ambulances like every single day just going through the city oh and that's God. just that's just heartbreaking yeah. you know and it's scary like i mean i'm scared enough being in my suburb like in toronto right um Although like here it's not it's not dense like New York like man you're you're compact over there oh yeah um, like you can't even go I mean you know just going to the grocery store is like a that's a scary experience I mean it's a scary experience for me now even though I know that in my community um, thankfully 
we don't have a lot of active cases here. Like we have like maybe seven or eight active cases. Like it's pretty low. Right. Um, but you still just can't take the risk because listen, I don't want to get sick and I don't want to get other people sick. And yeah. I'm sure most people feel that way too. Um, but yeah, for them being in New York, like, man, I felt for them seriously. Mm. Like oh, for sure. that is brutal. And there's something super isolating, like, like extremely isolating about being in a city where there's so many people and there's so much to do. And like, that, that, that's really a city that's built on, you know, the people's backs. Like it's, it's, it's about the community in New York city. Everybody's just, it's like one melting pot, you yeah. know? And yeah. I feel like being disconnected from people in that way and, and having to self isolate in New York city is like the worst thing ever. <laughs> you oh, know? Yeah. Yeah. I can totally, I can totally imagine what, uh, what suburb are you based in right now? In Thornhill. Thornhill. In Toronto. But I'm at like Young and, and like Steele's area. Okay. Just uh, the city. Like it, like it, two blocks up for me becomes Toronto, basically. Right. right. Gotcha. It's like Vaughn, I guess. It's kind of like up in the air. I don't know exactly where, like where I'm sort of located because I know I'm, I'm between Young and Bayview and all this stuff. So like some people say it's Marco. Some people say it's Thornhill. I'm just like, fuck it. It's Vaughn. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> You mentioned you've been like riding your bike and stuff. Do you have any like new hobbies or anything that you've picked up? I've been playing a lot of video games. You know, I've always sort of been a gamer growing up. Okay. Um, I just haven't had the time to do it. And also my brother, uh, he goes to, he's like, he has, it's his PlayStation. Okay. And uh, I live at home with my family. Right. Um, and he goes away for school. So he's never home. And when he's not home, he takes the PlayStation with him. Right. But obviously now because everybody's home, like I've been playing video games like a motherfucker. <laughs> uh, and that's pretty much it. Like a new hobby is like, listen, I, I, I love playing guitar. Like, like even though it's like my quote unquote job or whatever that mm-hmm. means, like I play guitar every day for hours just cause that's what I love to do. It's what I've always loved to do. Right. Um, unfortunately I haven't been exercising as much as I should. Like I'm usually a pretty avid like gym goer and I like working out at the gym and you know, obviously again, like those are all closed down and, even though, you know, you could do some home workout stuff, like, I, I'm sort of the person that, like, needs to walk out the door to get, like, my workout in. Like, right. I don't want to, it's like I could do so many other things at home. Yeah, I <laughs> gotcha. Like, working out, you know. Yeah, yeah, like, leaving uh, leaving the house gives you that motivation, right? So, I walk out the door, I'm like, I'm going to the gym, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to run my bike, like. That sort of a thing I could do because now that the restrictions, I know that well in Toronto is it phase two down there? Now? Uh, I think like phase two is on the cusp of of opening up, or maybe it has already opened up. I know like um, no, no, it, it definitely has because I know that uh, patios are open now. So <laughs> patio and it's perfect. It's like patio season, so at least like local local bars and restaurants and stuff can like start hopefully uh making some sort of income i know there's been so many places that have had to shut down which is so sad to see um so yeah phase two is is happening now like like it's a little bit at least in my community like most people have like backyards and stuff so i we've actually been able to hang out with people right because now you can hang up to hang out with up to like 10 people yeah or something yeah 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 yeah. Um, you can have been able to do that and you know have barbecues and all that kind of stuff you're obviously staying outside um and you know, being safe with that. So that's been a little bit better lately, just because like the first two months of this thing, it was like, everybody's just crammed. We got cabin fever. Mm -hmm. Like, like I wouldn't leave my house. I was, I was like deathly scared of just like stepping outside. Um, but as time and time has passed, it's like, okay, well it's, it's easing up a little bit. We're seeing the cases go down in my area, like significantly. And, um, the weather's so nice. It's like, it's so hard to stay inside. Cause it's just so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so at least I've been able to have friends over and all that kind of stuff. But like, just to go back to like the hobbies kind of thing, like, I mean, I, I really just been playing a lot of video games, honestly, like what I've been drinking a lot. <laughs> 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 yeah. That's maybe that's a new thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, right. <laughs> but, uh, what else am I going to do? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, for sure. What, uh, what video games are you playing right now? Just beat the entire God of War series. Okay, nice. Um, which are fucking unbelievable. Yeah, like it's like it's like art. 
literally. Yeah. And yeah. like the last installment, like I guess you can call God of War four, but it's really just called God of War. Yeah. Um, it's one of the best video games I've ever played. And uh, I was playing a lot of like uh, Call of Duty. Yep. When this first sort of this first like started happening, but I got bored of it. Uh, now. Mm-hmm. And I just started playing a Spider-Man game last night, like the last Marvel Spider-Man game. It's a lot of fun. I beat it before. I'm just trying to play it again. Yeah, yeah. Bored. Oh yeah, man. That that game's a that game's a lot of fun too. Yeah, I know when uh, COD kind of also came out at oh, like pretty much when I don't know. I think like the highest point of all people playing video games uh, was kind of when Warzone came out and they let it come out for free. So I know that's like all my buddies were playing that. We've kind of moved on now. I think. Uh, most of uh, most of my friends now are uh, playing The Last of Us Two, which just got released. So I'm playing through the first one just so I can <laughs> come right into the second one with like you know fresh eyes. It's going to be made for PS4. It's going to be great. I'm I'm like really excited. So <laughs> yeah, I've been doing a lot of gaming too. <laughs> well, it's funny that you say that because I actually I started playing The Last of Us the other day. Yeah. And uh, it was just too scary for me. Like, I got spooked, you know? And, and, and it's funny because, like, I used to play Dead Space, which are terrifying games. Oh, yeah. You know? I remember Dead Space. when I was, like, 14, 15. And, like, now, I guess, as I've gotten older... Well, I guess what's also changed is, like, now we all play with headsets. Yeah. Know? Oh, it's yeah. So you're playing. submersed in that sound, man, and it is terrifying. It's so scary because you can hear the creatures behind you and all that kind of stuff, and... It's so much different than playing on like a TV that you're like ten feet away from. Yeah. And there's TV audio. It's like now I don't think I can go back and play Dead Space with headphones. <laughs> Even though that that I would say that's like way scarier than Last of Us. Like that's a that is a true horror game. Oh yeah, um, you're all alone on a spaceship with aliens coming at you at every corner. Terrifying. <laughs> terrifying. But at the time, like but it's one of those games I feel like where like you sort of get used to like the uh the um the rhythm of it like you sort of you you, you could sort of guess when the the jump scares were going to happen yeah all that kind of stuff like you sort of get integrated over like the first hour and you're like okay okay now i get it you know i mean it's still scary it's still very spooky yeah <laughs> um but the last of us man I, just, I couldn't do it like i got into this thing and i was like oh man like this is just i was shaken just because of the headphones you right know? yeah and i play on like a little monitor now like now that we're all like a depth of the video game thing. Like I have a little monitor, it's like 15 inches or something. It's like tiny. Cause you know, then you get the best graphics and all that kind of stuff. Right. No, uh, frame rate drop and all that stuff. Um, and with my headphones, I'm like, I just can't handle it. Like I had to <laughs> shut it off. I want to play something happier. It's also kind of an interesting game to be playing right now because it sort of deals with the issue of a pandemic and all yeah, that stuff. And definitely. Like crazy. Yeah. So, uh, it sort of like hit home a little bit. Yeah, for uh, sure. I felt a bit weird like starting it up and I was like, oh yeah, this is like, I, I, I knew it was a zombie game. Like I remembered it being a zombie game, but I, I forgot it was just like a, a sickness that took over people and people got sick first. And then like, it was like, yeah, a bit too close to home for sure. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm just like, I'm just putting my head down and getting through that one for sure. Try and get through it because apparently it's one of the greatest stories of all time. You it know, is. It's amazing. It's one of the greatest video games of all time. So I'm like, shit, I gotta, I gotta try. It, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I have to muster up like the balls you know, for <laughs> the next couple of days to sort of get back into it. Maybe I'll play it during the day because I've been gaming at like one, two in the morning. Yeah. Um, which yeah. is also like terrible because it's you know late and dark. And yeah. It's scary. Yeah. The time. witching hour. <laughs> try it out during during the day like i think it's it's also like like you said for dead space once you get a bit more used to it it's uh, it becomes less scary like uh like you know you can you can like hear the guys you also have like that that uh you can press a button so you can kind of see through walls and like see people around which i'm like when i play it at night i'm like holding down on that button button all the time i'm like i don't want to be <laughs> terrified right now <laughs> it's like oh my god it's just so scary with the sounds that those things make you yeah. know, and then there's the other there's the, there's the other creatures that are like I think they're called like splitters or something. They're blind, but if oh, you don't the, move, they the, can't see you. Yeah, the clickers. The clickers. Oh my god! Like that. That's what made me stop because I'm in this <laughs> mission now. It's right off the top of the game. I'm pretty sure where you get the little girl and you're taking her to like a base or something because she was infected, but she might have the cure or whatever. Yeah. And you get separated from the two, and now you have to make it through like this area where oh, all these dude, clickers. I, I just played that part yesterday. <laughs> yeah. 
like that's what made me turn it off. I'm like, I can't, I can't do this. I had to do the same thing. Like, yeah, I had to walk away. I, I just finished it like last night and I got through it and I'm like, okay, cool. I'm putting it off again. I gotta, I gotta walk away from this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, it's just, it's a scary one. And, and people don't like, nobody prepared me for it. Cause when I looked it up, everybody's like, oh, it's not that scary. Like, it's not really a horror game. And I beg to differ. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's jokes. Um, all right, man. Well, let's uh, let's get back to talking about music. Um, um, yeah. So I uh, I just wanted like I do want to talk about the album and kind of the making of. I did think it was interesting, and I think I brought this up last time we talked. But um, the the fact that the album came out on Valentine's Day, the band's called Broken Love. Was that like kind of something you guys planned for? Semi intentional. Like I, originally, it was supposed to come out last November. Okay. Um, but there was like an issue with the vinyl pressing or something like that. Um, so they're like, okay, we have to push it back. Mm-hmm. And then we're all like, well, you know, what's an appropriate date? We're all like, fuck it, Valentine's Day. Like, that's just so great. You know, it just makes sense with the name of the band. Obviously, um, it goes hand in hand, Broken Love, Valentine's Day. It just makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. It's almost like liberal, you know? Yeah. And uh, it was a good move. I, I thought that was awesome, you know? Um, that was sort of a collective thing. It wasn't actually meant to do that first time around, mm-hmm. but uh, it was more of a happy accent, I would say. Yeah. And uh, you had been working on the album for like a long time. I, I think you told me you had a bunch of songs written like years and years before. When did you decide like it was you were ready to start getting a band together and getting getting the tracks recorded and all of that? When when were you like, OK, I'm, I'm good to finally start getting getting stuff going? It, it's interesting because like I, I had a bunch of songs. I actually made a record before the one mm-hmm. that everybody here like has heard now um, that got scrapped. Okay. Um, like I, I sort of went through the process for a couple of years. Like, uh, like I guess I, I started essentially writing for the record when I was like 17. Um, and I, I mean, I guess it, it was just through like trial and error. Like I obviously had a great team that I was working with too that could sort of sift through things with me. And let me know when um, was the right time to pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. Um, And also through making a record before I'd done the one with Joel or the debut record, I guess we could say. um, I made another record that was just like thrown out, basically. Um, And that also helped sort of like, like, um, what's what I'm looking for? Just, just make the process more clear, like make the, make the end goal more clear. You know, um, it just shaped, it shaped the, uh, what the next record would sound like more, which essentially, I, I mean, I, I'm saying the next record, like I have two albums out there, mm-hmm. but, uh, but th- there was a record before this that got scrapped. And I think that that was a good learning process just because it taught me even more so what I wanted to do in the end. Right. And, uh, it, I mean, you know, it's funny because I didn't do this record with my band that, that you met and saw. Like, I, I actually did it on my own. Oh, okay. Um, as a trio. Like, I had two of my friends, dude, Dylan Wood and Brian Weaver, great drummer and a great bass player that I worked with before. And at the time, I didn't know the guys that I was playing with now. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Would have been nice if I did. Would have made things a lot easier. Right. But, um... I had those dudes come in, play the bass and drums, like knock them out of the park because they're pros and they know what they're doing. So that helps out a lot because, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not as much of a session guy or whatever as those dudes were. Right. And they're fantastic and they lay down the shit amazing. It sounds great. Um, And then I played all the guitars on the record. Okay. Um, And of course I sang. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Everything. Um, but yeah, like putting the band together was, was of course, like, you know, the next logical step after finishing the record. What, what did happen, though, is like, you know, the record was sort of pushed back for a while. Um, we didn't know, we didn't have a home for it, essentially. Like, I wasn't signed to Spine Farm, mm-hmm. who I'm signed to now, um, for about, like, a year or so after the record was done. So I was just sitting around, you know. And in that time frame, it was like, okay, well, let's put a band together. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, let's start playing shows because, like, I I didn't play any of the songs live for like a year, uh, and I was doing some. Well, that's not true. I was doing some some stuff in Toronto, just my friends who are musicians up here, just like getting gigs at like some bars downtown, and you know, we could bring a lot of people because 
we went to a big high school, everybody knew we were musicians, and just through our friends, we could bring a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, it wasn't like new fans, because these are just people that know us. Right. Uh, but but eventually, my manager helped me put a band together in New York, and that's when I met Kyle and Nick and Russell. Um, and we just sort of gelled. I mean, that's actually... A little untrue. Like we had a different drummer before we had Russell. We had this dude Anthony, who was a great friend of mine, and uh, it just didn't work out. And we had to get a new drummer. Um, and Nick went to high school with Russell, so there he knew each other, and he brought him in after like a month or two, and it just clicked right away. And essentially, we just kept playing and playing and playing and doing like the New York circuit and whatever. And my manager is amazing, and she knows she knows who to call when when the time is right, you know, because she's been working in the record business for like 20 plus years. Right. Um, So she's worked at, uh, you know, various labels and worked with a lot of people. So it really just, the songs we knew were there. Like, like I'm confident to say the songs were there and the record was done. So that part was already done, but now we sort of have to nail down the performance aspect and make sure that as a band, we sound tight, we look great and, um, and we perform well, so that took a little bit of time, mm-hmm. but of course, through like the, the showcasing thing and just being put in front of a bunch of people, we ended up, um, finding a home with Spine Farm, you know, which is great. And we've been with them for a little over a year now and it's been nothing, nothing but amazing. You know, I love everybody there and what they've been doing for the band is amazing that's awesome man uh yeah tell me about getting signed like were you um did you have like a few labels that you were looking at and then what what made you decide to go with spine farm in the end yeah so i i guess like i was actually signed to another label before i was on spine farm okay um and they actually got bought out i was on a label called razor and tie okay and what happened was is is concord is this other big company and they sort of bought out a bunch of other labels. And when they bought out Concord, I got dropped. Sorry. When Concord bought out Razor and Tire, I got dropped off that label. Um, and that was like a whole thing. Cause you know, we had to pick up, pick up again and do it all over again and all that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, but you know, when we went with Spine Farm, it was sort of an easy decision. It was kind of a no brainer because there was a lot of people coming to see, the band and, and and you know one of the things i really hate and that that happens a lot in the industry is like people be like oh yeah love the band great uh call me when this happens you know like keep we'll keep in touch like let me know when they play another show or when they have more songs it's like well we already knew that we had it you know and we had a team that already knew that we we were like ready to go mm-hmm. and it's sort of like you know, get on the train or, or, uh, or don't. <laughs> right. Like we're going, we're yeah. moving forward with or without you. Gotcha. And you know, when, when the spine park dudes showed up, like Darren is my A&R there. Like he immediately got it. He showed up, saw the band, heard the music. He's like, Oh yeah, I got it. And like, that's what we want because there was no, it, there, it was like no frills. You know what I mean? Like he right. just came in, understood what we did, understood what we were saying, understood what we st- stood for. Um, got the vision, got the uh, the creative aspect, and all that kind of stuff, and it, it was it was just an easy decision, honestly. Right. Um, you know, we had a bunch of people that were sort of into it, but nobody was really pulling the trigger. Mm-hmm. And with him, it was like immediate. He came in, he's like, "Oh, love it, let's do this." And that's and what, like, yeah, Fuck. that's what you want. You just what you want someone that believes right. in you like that, right? Right, and that's like the kind of energy I want too. It's like a winner's, it's like a, a, a it's, it's it's a winner's um, um, mindset, you know. Like he just saw, it, he liked it, he got it. And he's like, "Fuck it, let's do it. Let's not lollygag," you know. Yeah. A lot of other people are more apprehensive because I get it. Listen, like especially with major labels and stuff, it's 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 a big risk signing a new young rock band that's right. already like terrifying. Just saying that, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> And it's also a risk, you know, signing a band that has zero following. Like, we had nothing, you know, before we started. Sure, we had the music, but, like, nobody knew who we were. We had no socials and all that kind of stuff, which is a question that gets brought up 
time and time again. Like, oh yeah, the band's great. How many followers do they have on Instagram? Yeah. Oh yeah, how many subscribers do they have on YouTube? It's like, fuck that. Like, you know, you can't deny somebody's talent because they don't have a million subscribers on YouTube. I know. You know? Yeah. Which is terrible. And it's like, there was a point, I remember when Justin Bieber got signed, um, everybody immediately was like, oh fuck, okay, the new thing is YouTube. Let's just go on YouTube and we're going to find artists that way. You know? And a lot of them were surprised to see that like, Again, I've, I've been doing this for a while, actually. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've been in the business since I was like 12. Believe yeah. Not. But um, but uh, I was seeing it time and time again. You know, people would take a chance on these YouTube artists or like at the time there was Vine and like whatever. And there's a few that made it through, you know, because they are truly talented, like Beaver, Shawn Mendes, you know, whatever. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple more in there. But they're actually talented and they, they, they um, you know, they're the real deal. But there was a lot of people that were getting signed because, yeah, they have great voices when they sing into a camera and record it. But then you don't take in the performance aspect of it. You know, can they perform? Can they interact with people? Um, are they charismatic? Like all that kind of stuff sort of fell through. Right. And to me, I was like, oh, well, then we should just let this, you know, the whole YouTube subscriber, whatever social media narrative like die because that doesn't mean anything. You know? Yeah, yeah for I mean, sure. The best way to, to judge a band is play a show. And invite the, the industry to the show. And then they should get it. You know? Listen to the music before, you get the record, whatever, a couple songs. You know, a little promo reel, I would say. And then see how they perform, you know? Because at the end of the day, that's what's selling, you know? People don't really buy music anymore. So if your band can't tour or perform live, you're essentially fucked. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> exactly, know? man. Exactly. Like, that's really the only way a label can making their money back is by selling tickets as well as for the, the band and the artists too. So yeah, that, that's a, that's a very, very good point. Different though for pop artists and hip hop artists and a lot of country artists too, because those are still formats where radio plays the shit out of them mm-hmm. and, um, and they sell a lot of records. You yeah. know, they actually do sell a lot of records still. Right. Um, which is a little bit different for rock. Like it's not a, Rock is not as big of a genre as those are anymore, you know. I mean, quietly, I think it's just as big. I think the underground is a lot louder than people think, you mm-hmm. know. It's just that rock is typically less mainstream. Yeah. So it's it's less in your face and people just don't recognize that it's just as a just as a um, abundant, but it's just not it's not in your face. You right. know, you're not you're not it's not being it's not being let known that it's around as much. Right, right. How do you, um, how do you, how does that make you feel? Like, uh, just knowing that, you know, pop and like EDM and, you know, hip hop are like the main thing now and rock's kind of not as mainstream. I mean, in, the, in a way, it's like, that's kind of what rock has sort of always been, mm-hmm. you know? I mean, it's always sort of been secular and been its own thing. I mean, of course, there's times in like the 80s and 90s where like rock blew the fuck up Mm-hmm. And everybody and their mother was like trying to incorporate some sort of element of rock in their music, yeah. you know, because it was so so popular at the time. But there is something special about about it being quiet or quieter, I should say, because there is a, a still a bunch of huge rock bands that get played on the radio nonstop. I mean, listen, like our our song "Shot Down" mm-hmm. killed on radio in Canada. So I can't say that rock is essentially dead because it's not. Um, it's just sort of taking a back seat right now. Yeah. But um, you, you, I, my whole thing on it is like, well, a lot of people don't really know what they like at the end of the day. A lot of people don't really like music. They just sort of listen to what they're being told to listen to. Yeah. And, you know, it's like very generic. It's like these people, they just listen to what's on the radio or like what's being played at the club or whatever. Like they're not going in deep on music. And I feel like musicians will always have a, a, a large appreciation for, you know, real music. People actually play mm-hmm. stuff that's a little bit more intellectually advanced. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of casual listeners who are actual fans of music. I think those people always end up being into, into rock and more instrumental based music, you know, blues, jazz, even country, you know, like all that stuff is great. I mean, there's a lot of great pop too. I'm not trying to take that away from anything. Like I like hip hop and pop too. It's just when it keeps getting shoved down everybody's throats and that's what the media portrays is like the thing, you know, it's mm-hmm. like, of course, more people are going to like it. The only way for rock to end up back in that place is for the media to be like, oh, well now it's, you know, 
now it's this shit. You know? Yeah, and, yeah, and definitely. Even in the in the early two thousands or the mid two thousands, that's when like post grunge was huge, and all the huge bands were like Nickelback and Creed, and uh, and like uh, Three Days Grace and and uh, all those kinds of bands. Even like pop punk bands, like All American Rejects were huge. Mm -hmm. um, fucking Blink, like Blink One Eighty Two, yep. yeah, Sum Forty One. Like that was like the sound of the time when I was when I was like six, seven, eight. Uh, coming up like that's what everybody listens to we all listen to Simple Plan which is Canadian so I don't know if everybody knows that band, but <laughs> <laughs> you know we all listen to Sum 41 and, and Blink and, and Green Day Green Day is a little bit different for me because they're 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 just a, a, like a just a good rock band I think they sort of have their own lane you know yeah they yeah they've, they've, they've also changed so much right that that's a band where you can like see all kinds of growth I know so many people that are like so pissed off with what Green Day is now, but it's like, they've been making music for, oh my God, like almost 30 years now. Like they're not going to sound the same like they did back in the day. <laughs> that's what I love about them. Like that's why I sort of jumped off the pop punk thing as I got older because Green Day sort of progressed and matured and became something different. Even though people categorize them as like, you know, quote unquote pop punk. Mm -hmm. I never even, I never saw them as that. Like as opposed to like Blink and Sum 41, who to me were like more of that sound or whatever. Right. Um, and countless other bands. Like they were always more like actual punk rock to me. Right. You know? Right, right. Um, more, more like Ramones on steroids. Right. You know? Uh, to me, at least. And they progressed greatly. But, you know, the point I'm trying to make is that at the time, that was the popular thing. That was pop music. Yeah. You yeah. know? And I remember hating it at a certain point because everybody in my class when I was like in grade one was like, oh, listening to fucking American Idiot. That was like the huge album at the time. And yep. everybody in the class was listening to it. Like, it was the shit. Yeah. So, uh, like, that goes back to my point in saying that I don't think people really know what they like. You right. Know? It's I just think because it's just the media the tells them that's what's people cool. telling you that this is what to listen to right now. Right. You know? And with a, a band like... I mean, there's a couple bands that are sort of single-handedly like saving or putting rock back in the forefront like you know there's royal blood who are oh yeah amazing mm -hmm. you, you know and blew the fuck up like they're 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 massive now like yeah. after two records they're huge yeah um you got highly suspect another great rock band that has also like they have two records no three records now i'm wrong um and again, are like already massive, you know, in such a short time span. Right. And they got Greta Van Fleet, you know, like I'm not a, I'm not a, you know, despite what you think about them, that doesn't really matter. But the fact that they can put out an album, win a Grammy for it in today's climate, you know, as a rock band playing like raw rock and roll. Yeah. That's important, man. That's really important. Yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. Get into that. I mean, that's my. I don't know. I don't mean to keep going on forever. No, man. No, don't don't apologize. Don't apologize. I. Uh, yeah, I totally. I, I know what you're. I know what you're saying. Um, let's talk a bit more about about your album. I think we kind of got into it a little bit last time, but I wanted to know about working with Joel Hamilton. Man, was was that someone you you specifically wanted to like work with, or how did that happen? I was a fan of of the of the suspect stuff. You right. know, at the time, like it was interesting because. I was sort of seeing this decline. Like I was, I, I, I was very sort of fed up with like mainstream radio rock, like mm -hmm. that sort of sound. Yeah. You know, not that it's bad. Again, I'm not bashing anything. It's just not the sound I'm particularly into because it does have a very particular thing, you know, with the songwriting style, mm -hmm. the, the, the sound design, like all that kind of stuff is very, it's just too, um, how do I say it? Like, it's almost like too it's clean, just, right? Like it's it's digital, so it's just so. It's totally that, and people don't realize that. It's like rock is supposed to be this genre where people are um, are are like so so excited about real rawness, organic energy, you know, um, real drums, like real guitar amps, and all this stuff that you hear now. Despite what I think about it, like, listen, it's big for a reason and the songs are good. You know, that's how they get big. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of that stuff is fake drums and really, really cut up vocals that are tuned to shit, mm -hmm. you know, and the guitars are all fake amps, like they're all fractal systems and, and, um, and uh, uh, what is it, Kempers and all that kind of stuff, you know. 
which sort of takes the humanity out of rock and roll, which I think is like one of the main selling points of the genre, you know, that it's so human. Right. That's what rock is. It's about, it's about being real, you know? And that sort of like flips it because it's like, man, that's everything a lot of quote unquote rock fans hate about other genres and don't realize that they're sort of perpetuating that same idea with the bands they they think are, you know, real rock or whatever, you mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. Um, but on on that, like, I was I, I was feeling that, and I was like, man, like, wh- where are the cool young rock bands, you know, that are cool and real, you know? And I remember I was just like searching some forums because at the time I was already super into Royal Blood, so they were like the only band for me okay. at the time. <laughs> That, that was like knocking it out of the out of the park. Of course, and I'm talking like new bands. Of course, and there's a lot of other bands that I love, but like bands that were coming out and that were young and, and new, you know. Right. And uh, I was like looking up stuff on Google, like you know, bands that sound like Royal Blood, and then I saw Howie Suspect, and I listened to Lydia, and I'm like, holy fuck! I'm like, this is what rock should sound like. Yeah. You know, like this is real. This is this is raw. This is like emotionally deep but also like kind of punk and like careless you know um so i was like fuck like this is awesome mm-hmm. and when we started talking about producers for who's going to do my record i just looked up like on wikipedia um high suspects record and i saw joel hamilton mm-hmm. i clicked on his name and i was like oh man he's based in brooklyn i'm like that's cool like he's pretty much right here <laughs> i was in new york at the time right and uh Talk to my manager, and she's like, "Yeah, I actually know his manager." Oh no way! Okay, (laughs) sick. So, you know, that's really cool because again, then when he, you know, agreed to work with us, and and you know, thought that the songs were cool, and and and, uh, blessed us with his with his graciousness. Um, (laughs) uh, It's really cool to work with somebody that you're a fan of. Definitely, yeah. Because I know what I'm getting into. I know the sound that he that he. Uh, can achieve and um it made the process very very chill and fun you know because our alignment was 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 amazing the entire time we never disagreed about anything um the sound choice was awesome because you know uh he's he's more of like a real a real producer you know like he gets he captures real sound he's a really good engineer Mm -hmm. like he has all these little tactics, tactics to get very cool guitar sounds or get really great drum sounds and all that kind of stuff, like using small guitar amps and a lot of fuzz pedals, which is like, that's my vibe, you know? Right, There's a right. lot of producers that don't like fuzz because of the unruly sort of nature of it and how uh, uncontrollable it is. Right. Um, but he sort of loves the, or like, he, he, he can embrace the weirdness, you know? And yeah. The, and the, um, the, like the, the griminess, you know, um, cause I think that's what rock and roll is at the end of the day. He, he appreciates the imperfections in what it is. Gotcha. And, uh, that made it so great to work with him because we literally didn't disagree about anything. We right. didn't fight about anything, which <laughs> happens a lot when you're making a record. Oh, for sure. I can imagine. <laughs> but he was like, Oh yeah. Okay. I love your guitar. Um, let's try this pedal and this amp and let's plug it in here. And I'm like, Oh yeah, fuck. That sounds great. Okay, cool. You know, and we just went with it. Like it was super easy. Right. And, um, and he's also just a very good guy. Like he's, he, he, he just let me do my thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, sort of just got out of the way. It was amazing. Right. And you guys, um, you guys recorded on tape, right? Yeah. Yeah. Of it were on tape. Like all the bass and drums were completely to tape. Um, uh, you know, not not to my. It was to his. It, it, he was insisting, I guess I could say, because mm-hmm. that's how he likes to work. Like I would never show up to the studio and be like, "Oh yeah, let's do this on tape." By the way, right? You know, like <laughs> that's sort of uh, <laughs> that could be sort of like an egoistic or like just a demanding thing to to say. Right, right. But that's how he likes to work, and it creates a certain warmth and um, and like a, a a saturation you can't get. Um, otherwise, right. And, uh, a lot, some of the guitars were recorded to tape as well. Okay. Um, the vocals weren't because, you know, like I gotta, you gotta do a bunch of takes and stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's just too demanding for me. Right. Um, 
but I want to say like maybe 60 to 70 percent of the record is like tape you know yeah um which is awesome and like that's a cool experience for me because when you're playing the bed tracks with everybody like a lot of the bed guitar tracks like just the basic rhythm were to tape Mm -hmm. because we all recorded at the same time right that was fun because it's like you get the feel of a real band because we are literally recording at the same time and there's no click track like we're just going off sort of like an imaginary time like yeah there's a click track that maybe counts off the first four beats and then we have like a rough time that right. we're in mm-hmm. but if you actually listen to the record like if you're like you know a, a perfectionist like me um you notice that it's not completely on time in some areas. Like some parts that drag a lot, some parts speed up, you know, and that's on purpose just because that's the way a band feels. That's like real groove. Yeah, you know? that's where you get that authenticity again, right? Like that live off the floor feel. What we love about like, you know, Zeppelin and like John Bonham. Like, could you imagine putting John Bonham like to a click and like quantizing his drums? That's no. like, <laughs> that's fucking sacrilegious and yeah. disgusting you know yeah. like, i don't even want to think about it you know? <laughs> but like but what i'm saying is that what we love is, is the humanity and like and the, the real feel of something you know when you're playing with a bunch of other people and the time sort of waving back and forth it creates this real um this natural grooviness you know that's not static and it feels it feels good it feels better right you know yeah it's not mechanical mm-hmm <laughs> Cool, cool. Tell me about the uh, the album art. Uh, yeah. Well, that's that's awesome. I can't take full credit for that because I'm not a I'm not the graphic designer. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I think the dude who, his name who did it is Portland. I believe is his name. I could be getting that wrong, and I'm sorry if I did. Um, but you know, I sort of came up with like the rough idea. I was like, okay, like broken love. You know, it's not the most creative idea. I'm like, fuck. Let's just do like a dagger through a heart. Like kind of generic right you know i've seen it time and time again but it's also sort of like a timeless thing yeah you know yeah There's it something is. sort of cool about it being so obvious and relatable because we've all seen something like that um and they were like great you know this is cool because you know it, it sometimes it's cool to be like um sometimes it's cool to to just be obvious like i said and, and do something that's familiar yeah, and uh, you know we went through a couple revisions. Like at first, the album art was a little, it was a little like cartoony, you know. And I sort of wanted something that was more hyper realistic mm-hmm. and a little darker because I thought that maybe making it more, should I say, like lifelike, yeah. would be more striking of an image, right? Um, and yeah, you know, we went through the process and just like got a couple revisions done, and eventually they came out with what is the logo now Mm -hmm. and I couldn't be happier because I've always wanted my band to be recognized like with a symbol you know right like just like the Rolling Stones with the lips and the the teeth yep yep or or Errol Smith with the A and the wings you know or Guns N' Roses with the literal Guns N' Roses you know (laughs) yeah yeah Pink Floyd Dark Side of the Moon you know the list goes on it's like I, I, I would love for somebody to just throw that on a shirt or like spray paint it next to a building and people go that's broken love yeah you know cool and and correct me if i'm wrong but you have you have the logo tattooed on your forearm right i do have a tattoo on my forearm yeah well that's that's what i thought when i uh, first saw it i was just like this looks like just like a really cool like uh almost well not traditional tat uh, not american traditional but it looks like a tattoo design which uh which is really cool too i, I like that so you're getting that like like you said, that that realism look to it, but it's it's still it looks like a tattoo as well, which is which is also awesome. Almost like it reminds me of like um, like sailor tattoos. Yes, like exactly, kind of definitely. You know, and that was also sort of the uh, the intent behind it. Because listen, like I would love for people to get a tattoo on it. Some people actually have, which is fucking crazy. No you know, way! I can't believe somebody actually you know was willing to reserve a place on their body for my band like which is unbelievable that's um, cool of course i did it because like you know all in all i was like oh well if the band ever works out at least it looks cool <laughs> 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 you know uh <laughs> but but yeah you know that was sort of the intention too and like when i went to go get it tattooed on me i just brought the you know the picture and 
the the girl who did my tattoo was like, oh yeah, that's easy. Like it's pretty much made like a tattoo. Yeah, man, that's 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 awesome. Um, I wanted to chat a bit about. Uh, well, you mentioned you were in the states and that you've been in the industry for twelve years. So tell me, tell me the uh, Justin origin story. Like, what what were you doing in the states for so long? Uh, how how did you start out in the music industry? Like the Reader's Digest version. Yeah, let's do that. It's be a long one. <laughs> I got lucky when I was really young, you know, like my, my uncle was a great musician and sort of took me under his wing when I was like seven or eight and put me on to all the right stuff, all the great music, you know, that I'm still into now. Okay. And uh, he was a great guitar player um, as well. Was he like a, musician. was he a session, so, uh, session musician or? He like sort of stepped in and out of that world. I mean, he had a lot, he had a couple bands uh, in the nineties in Canada. Okay. And they would play like they would open for like Our Lady Peace and Tragically Hip, you know, like some pretty legendary bands. Oh, cool. Um, and then he did his own thing. He became like a club guitar player, which was awesome. Like he would play with like Tiesto and Paul Gunfold, and like he would just shred guitar at a club while they wow. would play like their beats and stuff. And it was just really original, and really cool. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah, super fucking cool. Like it was like a pioneering idea. I don't know if people are doing it now still, but. He was like a hit down in Mexico. It was like mainly where he toured. Um, but that's besides the point. All, all I'm saying is that I was like very inspired by him. Okay. And, uh, like through trial and error, like the first thing that I remember happening to me was like I uh, I got a gig to open for Akon when I was 12 years old. What? Uh, <laughs> I know, it's bananas, right? <laughs> like, like even looking back, it sounds ridiculous. Like, my dad had a business partner that he was working with that was also a, a, a booking agent. And I remember him waking me up at like two in the morning and he's like, calm down, like sing this guy's song, you know, I'm like <laughs> shit. Okay. And I went down to sing him a Skid Row song. I remember you Skid Row. Like that was like my shit. <laughs> okay. And, uh, I guess like a couple months later he called, he's like, Hey man, like we need an opener for Akon and West Palm beach. Like, would your son be willing to do it? I'm like, fuck yeah. Like, that's insane. You know, like, that's like my first real show ever. And wow. uh, it was insane. And um, basically, long story short, like through that, I ended up getting signed to, to uh, it wasn't his production company, but um, his manager had this production company in, in New York City and I moved there when I was 12 and I, I made like a, like, 40, 50 songs with his people. And, uh, it was a great experience. I mean, of course, at the time, like I was making like bubblegum pop, you know? Okay. Yeah. Like, I was gonna, I was going to ask what your sound was like back then. It was like a crossover of like Justin Bieber and like, um, who else was the other guy at the time? The blonde dude, um, Cody Simpson. Okay. Like, that kind of thing, you know, and still, but like, still trying to reference like Michael Jackson and all that kind of stuff because that's where I like came from. Like, I love MJ and Prince and all that kind of stuff. Like, okay. sort of like the funkier elements have always spoken to me. Um, and of course, I was twelve. I loved rock. Like, yeah, I was already playing guitar and I loved metal and I loved all that shit, you know. But it just didn't make sense at the time to be that rock guy. Like, listen, I'm twelve. My voice, my balls haven't dropped yet. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, my voice yeah. was was like you know, piercing. Right. And uh, I sounded like a girl and I wasn't really a capable musician, but we were writing songs. That was like my first taste of really writing songs. And, you know, we actually wrote a lot of really great songs, like looking back, like just for the time and looking at my age, like it, it was good for the time. And, you know, we had interest, man, like, like, like Hollywood records wanted to sign me and, <laughs> and uh, Sony wanted to sign me. And there was all these people that were like, holy shit, like let's make this happen. Um, and I said no. Like, I would walk into these meetings and just shoot myself in the foot because after I made the record, I came home and I listened to it all again. I'm like, man, I don't like any of this. Like, this is not who I am, you know? And, like, like, come on, the gusto of a 12-year-old kid. Like, I, I was, like, so fucking hard-headed and stubborn that I was like, I know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. Oh, yeah. You just know? a typical teenager. <laughs> Totally. And like, I don't know why I was so hard headed, but I have to thank myself for being that stubborn because I wouldn't be at this place now. And, um, you know, through that, it's like, I realized that if you come out and you release something like Justin Bieber shit, who's going to take you seriously 
a couple years down the line when you release a, a, a really rock record, it kind of ruins all your credibility. Definitely, you know? yeah. Personally, I think. Yeah, and, I agree with that. I think you lose that like authenticity. People are going to be like, man, you were, you were singing pop songs a couple of years ago. You're not a real rocker. Yeah. Right. Nobody forgives that, especially in rock. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Like, maybe in other genres, you know, you can go from making, like, I mean, you, again, you could see that with, like, Shawn Mendes and Justin Bieber. Like, they went from more bubblegum stuff to, like, real R&B and, like, good, and good pop now. Like, mm-hmm. good songs, yeah. you know, that are mature and they're cool and they're sexy still. But, like, it's mature and I can take it seriously. But at the time, it was like, oh, my God, this is, this is too much. Right. You know, <laughs> that's a natural progression I see out of that sound. You know, but you're not going to go from Justin Bieber to Soundgarden. You know, like, yeah. it's just not going to happen. Right. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, through the years, you know, I just sort of went through, again, trial and error. Like, I met this dude um, who was, like, a country uh, songwriter. Um, his name was Shane Stevens, and I, 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 I owe so much to him because he really taught me how to songwrite, okay. essentially. And he took me under his wing, and I moved to, to uh, New York with him when I was, like, 16, and we were making more like country pop rock, I would say, but still always leaning towards the rock stuff because he was the first guy to sort of let me do my thing. Right. You know? And were you uh, were you just singing on these or were you starting to play guitar? Since I was like 11. So I was still playing guitar and stuff um, when I was 12 because oh, I okay. wanted to include that element, you know, in right. it. Because I guess that was like one of the selling factors. Like, oh, he's young, he can play guitar, like whatever that means. Right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I was playing guitar and everything. And, you know, we wrote a lot of good songs, a lot of really, really good songs. Um, but again, it's just a natural progression. Like, you know, at the time I still was trying to figure out who I was and what I wanted to say. And even though I wanted to make this heavier shit, I was sort of in this position where I was like, okay, well, you know, that stuff isn't it's not as successful as doing this stuff. So it's like, what, what road do I want to go down? Because if I release stuff, that's more pop and whatever, it, there's a chance that I might do better. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, the big change or the big change for me was we moved out of New York and moved to LA together. And, um, at the time, I guess now I'm like 17 or whatever. Mm-hmm. And as soon as we get out there, I was like, fuck, we got to put a band together. Like enough of all this. You know, like, let's put together a band. And, yeah, like, he, again, he's another dude that's been in the industry for a long time. He knew who called to make the connections and put the people together. And essentially, I had my first rock band, you know, when I was 17 in L.A. Uh, really, really great musicians. And, you know, naturally, as we started playing together, you know, even the songs we wrote that were more, quote-unquote, pop rock, started becoming more rock just because of how we played and the dynamic of a band now changes everything. Right. Because up until that point, I've been used to doing everything to tracks. You right. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and like basically that's like where like everything changed because now I had this band and I was making rock music and slowly and surely as I got older, you know, I mean, I was 17 living alone essentially in LA. Like I got into a lot of trouble, you know, and did a lot of shit I shouldn't have and, uh, lived a lot of life, I guess you could say. And, um, and I figured out slowly and surely more of what I had to say and and what I stood for. And, um, the song started getting more aggressive and darker and heavier. Um, until it got to the point where I sort of had to step away from the, my mentor at the time, because I was like, listen, like, I love you. Like we love each other. We work great together, but, I'm just going on a different path, right? you know? Right. And again, like I just basically kiboshed another project, like the whole thing, you know, <laughs> it, it never saw the light of day, but what did happen is like through that band, I got signed to Razor and Tie. Okay. Um, through my old rock band. And w- um, was this, what was the name of this rock band? Was it Broken Love back then or? Called Markham, like Markham, Ontario. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, we, well, there's nothing out there. Like, I mean, Maybe on YouTube you could find like old video of uh, videos of us like playing live, right? You know, but we didn't release any music, and um, I got signed under that band. Essentially, again, it was still like a one man band. It was still my band, and I hired everybody around me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wrote the songs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but at the time, you know, I, I would say we were making music when I got to that more rock place and we got signed by that rock label. The music was more like Buck Cherry. I would say okay, 
like airborne, maybe like a little ACDC, like that kind of stuff. Right. Or like more sexual kind of like, you no, know, I mean, I, I hate to say it, but like cock rock. Right. You know, <laughs> okay. <laughs> like that kind of thing, um, which I like loved when I was a kid, you know, um, ACDC is exempt from that because they're like one of the fucking greatest bands of all time. Right. You know, but I love like 80s hair metal. I loved rat and poison and warrants and like that sort of seeped into what I was trying to do because I was in this LA thing. We were playing on the Sunset Strip. It was like that vibe. So that Definitely. was sort of like the vibe, you know? <laughs> like, right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that kind of sound. And on the flip side, I was always a grunge guy. Like I've always been a grunge guy and that's sort of been my home all the time. Okay. Um, so again, I got signed with this band and I was like, I don't like any of the songs. <laughs> I got to do it again, you know? And that's basically what happened now. So I ended up, you know, new batch of songs, new sound, trying to be a little heavier, a little darker, you know, drop tuning guitars, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. singing a little bit more aggressive, uh, saying things, you know, enough with writing love songs and about girls and stuff, because what the fuck do I know? about love and girls at like 18 years old like, right <laughs> you know I, I lived on my own for three years at that point i'm not i've never been in a relationship before i've never been in love so it's like that's another thing i have to factor why am i writing all these songs about like sex and shit it's like what the fuck do i know like you know <laughs> right it's yeah it's a character it's right. like a part that i'm playing i'm like i have to be more real i have to be more authentic and um and that's essentially what led to this, to Broken Love, you know? Cool. Like, I started writing all these songs that really, you know, writing these songs that spoke to me, and I felt I could stand behind it, actually represented who I was as a person. And, uh, and yeah, that's essentially how we got here, you know? Cool, that's man. Like the short version. Obviously, I can go on for hours about it. Right, but, uh, right, yeah, yeah. You know? So, yeah, so you've, you've like, you found yourself now. You're being your most authentic self in, uh, with, with uh, what you're making with Broken Love. Now I don't even question it because I don't feel like I'm being held back or tied down. You know, I'm also at the age now I'm, I'm 23 where nobody's really telling me what I have to be anymore. You right. know? Yeah. Like yeah. when you're 16, it's easy for people to influence you and tell you how you should be because you're young. What the hell do you know? But exactly. now I'm a capable adult, you know, right. I've lived some life. Um, I've had some crazy experiences and I know what I have to say now. Now it's not even a thought. I just sit down and whatever I come up with now, it just sounds like, like me, yes. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. And that's such a, like, that's such a beautiful thing to happen, right? Like to, to finally have that where you're just like, this is me Absolutely. as I am. Like it's, it's great. There was a lot of things like I remember being in LA and meeting a lot of these other young musicians and seeing them get so excited about their own music. You know, and listen to their own music when, you know, nobody else was around, but I was with them. We played in the car together, and I'd be like, wow, these guys really fucking love what they do. Right. Like, they could put it on and unabashedly just love it, you know, and feel proud of it. And I didn't have that feeling with right. any of my music at the time. And that was really, like, soul, soul sucking, you know, like, it hurt. Right. You know? Yeah, for and sure. I'm like, shit, I want to be at that place where I can jam to my music. And every time I'm like, fuck, yeah. Like, that's right, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. Like, otherwise, you're just, like, kind of, like, faking it, right? And then it's just not... Totally. Again, not authentic, which is, like, that seems to be a, a big theme in this conversation we've been having, um, is authenticity. People can smell it on you. Like, literally, when you're out there playing music that you don't believe in, like, you don't last long. Because no. Because people can feel it, they can taste it, you know? They can hear it. It's, like, it, it, it becomes very clear that what you're doing is an act. And you fizzle out, you know? Yes. Yeah. And if there's anything, like, specifically, I would say the era of, like, 90s grind just taught anybody who's playing rock is to just fucking be yourself, man. Yeah. Like, stop trying to be somebody else. And that's what I loved about those guys. You know, they didn't care. They didn't dress, like, the way everybody else dressed. They just got up and played the music that yeah. they loved and that spoke to them. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Like, look at Kurt Cobain getting on stage in a dress just because he's like, fuck it. <laughs> exactly it's like so hilarious but it's also like well fuck like he doesn't care he literally doesn't give a shit it's so cool that he doesn't care yeah you know yeah but yeah. he knows the music is good and he likes playing the music and and he stands he stands behind it like, yeah and it's real as fuck like you know it obviously comes across that that is 
truly him, you know, and it's powerful. It like hits more in that way. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It strikes for sure. Forward. For sure, man. For sure. Well, man, I think this is a, this is a really good point to, to bring this, uh, bring this to an end. Like this is, uh, ending on a very high note <laughs> something i ask everyone that i have on what uh and you know uh, during covid actually a lot of people are finding uh kind of new music and stuff it, it, what's like the latest uh coolest coolest band that you found that you've come across that you've been jamming to through uh through the pandemic in like like a at an old school vibe okay like, i've been i've been getting into the oldest stuff i've been getting a lot to like neil young lately wicked and uh yeah, I, I, if I'm gonna say a new band, I, I, uh, I really like this band, um, Dead Poets Society. They're fucking amazing. Mm-hmm. Actually, you they're turned me on to them uh, when I interviewed you last time. I've been listening to them quite a I bit. Know I did. Yeah, man, they're <laughs> wicked. Yeah, they're great. They're like still up there. I've definitely been listening to a lot more older music. I would say over this, just trying to visit things that I haven't really given the time of day to, or like stuff that I should have listened to by this point. Right. You know. Um, like I listened to the Eagles two days ago and now I love the Eagles. Um, right. Nice. Yeah. So yeah. I'm going like, to say like Eagles, Neil Young, Dead Poet Society. That's who I've been listening to. Cool. Sick. Awesome, man. Well, Justin, thanks again for, uh, taking the time to chat with me today, man. And, uh, really looking forward to, uh, when you guys are able to get out there and do some shows again, I'll definitely be there, uh, be there for the next one. Let me ramble. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it.